All right, everyone, welcome back. Draskal here with another replay analysis. Going to be watching Dubu today. Very high-ranked player who plays in US East, so North American region. Just going to be talking about the early game five decision-making process for everybody out there who's still a little bit fuzzy on what you can do and what you cannot do in the early game. I'll probably be doing a few more of these just based on different heroes and stuff because I believe currently I already have an AA video out. But I watched this one for the first eight minutes or so, and there's a lot of things to cover. So let's go ahead and start with the items that Dubu has purchased. He has both wards, the Sentry and the Observers. He has two sets of Tangos, a Salve, Fairy Fire, Smoke, and a Branch. So I'll start off by saying this. The best way to decide what items to start with is to know what you're landing against beforehand. So we're looking at the enemy team's lineup. We can just pull up the scoreboard here really quick. And we're assuming that based on player, as Matthew is going to be playing on a Tinker here, that it's most likely going to be a Tinker in the offlane position, safe lane Luna, mid invoker, offlane DK, and then five on dying, right? So that should mean that in our lane, there's going to be a Tinker and there's going to be a Dragon Knight. Now, this might not always be obvious, but the main reason that we can tell this right away from a high MMR game is that people have a tendency to play the same roles. In some situations, there will be a lane ambiguity, and you won't be able to tell who's going to be where. If that happens, just do your best guess. Whatever you feel like would be best for your core in the lane as the five player in the beginning is going to be your best shot. So two sets of tangos, a salve, all the words, fairy fire. This stuff is to both secure vision in the early game, obviously, but it's also because he understands that his hero matchup is going to be a heavy trading lane. So what does that mean? Dragon Knight has a lot of regen, he has a stun, and he has a nuke. Tinker has pretty good level 1 stats, decent attack range, he has level 1 laser, he's also going to be trading a lot. So in the spirit of that, knowing that AA is one of the better laning heroes for just trading, he's gearing up to take a lot of hits. So when you're buying all this regen, what you're really saying is, I want to hit this guy, and I am willing to be hit back. That's the whole purpose of trade. I hit this guy, he hits me, I use my regen, my carry safely farms creeps, while the four is either attacking me, or I'm attacking him, or I'm hitting the Dragon Knight, so on and so forth. So the whole philosophy here is that when you're starting with this much regen, hit and be hit. And save yourselves for your safe laner. If you notice that you're running low on regen as the five, it is acceptable and probably just good most games to buy more salves for either your one player or yourself, depending on the situation. So that being said, we can go ahead and get things underway. I'm going to fast forward a tiny bit in the beginning. We're going to see an early smoke. The reason that players do this is because it's going to allow them to get to the ward location that they want before it's physically possible for the enemy team to get there without smoking themselves. So if you didn't know, when you smoke, you actually get 15% movement speed. So for a 300 movement speed hero, that's what? 45 MS? That's essentially just having boots in your inventory until the smoke wears off. So when you get there, in this location right here where he's going to be placing an observer ward, you're trying to gather information, see if the enemy team is going for some kind of first blood or if they're going for the bottom rune, how many heroes are going to be there. Sometimes you might not know the lanes for sure, this is a really good way to find out, especially if the enemy team does some sort of early encroaching into your side of the map. And notice how the smoke didn't even break until he was right about to be mid. So he places both of these, and this ward as well. Normally, the dire ward is going to be on the top side, and it will not see his placement. So he put his body in the tree line, and then he very slowly like walk forward, place the ward, and then just immediately goes back. So this is a ward placement that is very unlikely to be killed unless the guy just blind sentries it or buys two sentries and places them on either side before the creep spawn. Now, you can do that, and it's fine, but that is another gold investment that you're making to deny that vision. So now he has both observers placed. He's made the distinction that his top lane will not need the observer. If it's an invoker mid and it's Quaswex, he may gank, but... A lot of Quaswex invokers, if they're going to gank, it's either a TP gank, and Quaswex can't really push the lane that well, and it's it's kind of odd. The, the Quaswex rotations are not as strong as they used to be, so 
maybe he just doesn't think that his off lane is going to need one. It's going to be a, a Dawn, Dawnbreaker Clockwork lane against Luna Undying. So there's two two possible reasonings. One, it probably doesn't matter too much because Clockwork actually does okay against Undying post like level three when you have two points in a battery. And you're not going to want to play next to each other regardless, so you probably don't need the vision. Or he just thinks the lane is probably not winnable because it's Luna plus Undying. Who knows? But either way, he has both observers here. And we're just going to fast forward a tiny bit more. We're just waiting for the runes to spawn. Not really much to say here other than just sitting on the hill. Also, that that is actually a talking point that we can cover. In the beginning of the game, sitting on the high ground is always safe. The hill is your friend. Being up on the hill is the safest spot to be in Dota 2, period. If it's nighttime or it's daytime and you're on top of a hill, the enemy team can't see you. Most of the time you're walking through a choke point. And you're walking into spells that could hit you before you have a chance to react. This is applicable throughout all stages of the game. In the beginning, the, the mid game, the end game, all of it. So when they're sitting up here, they're waiting to see information if the enemy team is going to show heroes where they're putting most of the resources for the rune and hopefully checking to see what the lanes are. So they see a couple of heroes here just doing some trading, skilling level one chilling touch, not too crazy. They're going to end up getting a two for two, I believe, or is it three for one? Okay, it's three for one. Now, his small camp is blocked, but he also has two sentries. So the first thing that he does, the very, very first thing that he does right here, is he blocks the large camp. So this is something, again, that is decided in advance. He knows Tinker DK is his lane, and Ursa is a very weak laner for the first few levels. Just super, super weak. I'm just going to select this hero for a second so you can see how pitiful his damage is. He does 50 damage. He has pretty good armor and he's fast, but he does no damage. 50 is, is, is nothing. His Fury Swipes at level 1, it's an 8 second reset and it's 9 damage per attack. So the amount of time that you have to be hitting for this ability to become scary, he'd have to hit you like 5, 6, 7 times before you have to really start worrying about Fury Swipes. So the lane dynamic here is that he envisions his safe lane and, and core matchup, or sorry, safe lane and support matchup as weaker than what the enemy team is. And if you can't gauge the difference between a strength in your lane at any given level, it's usually an okay bet to just block the large camp, because when you block it, you're preventing them from getting it. And it's a lot easier to just fully deny the camp from both teams if you don't actually know when you can pull, or if it's safe to pull, or if you're stronger, or if you should pull, you shouldn't pull. We'll go over the decision-making process of the rest of the stuff that he does, but if you're new to 5, or you're just new to the game in general, blocking the large camp in either side lane as the 5 is usually pretty, pretty okay. There are obviously situations where it won't be okay, but here it's fine. Now, he's going to be standing off to the left. And you'll notice he's going to be playing on this side a lot. And the main reason why you see most players on the left side of the lane as Radiant is because there's a lot of really nice juke paths down here. And if you get close enough to the tower... Let's see if I can move to free cam here. If you get close enough to the tower, you see this radius here. This is the tower's attack range. It also applies tower protection, which gives you a little bit of extra armor and health regen. So it kind of fulfills two roles. It makes you safer because the other guy has to walk in closer to hit you. You could potentially put him in tower range if he chases too far. And you could, like right now, he has a tower protection. It's actually bigger than auto attack range because he's not in it right now. So it's actually a little bit more. And he gets plus three armor and he gets one health regen. So whenever you're playing near your tower and you're hitting, you can just say to yourself, okay, this trade is, is more efficient than it would normally be for my hero. So we can see the Ursa is getting hit quite a bit here. Now notice he's not even looking at his camps right now. He is fully fixated on the lane. He's trying to get out as much damage as he feasibly can. He's not worried about creep equilibrium at all. He's trying to get the range creep. He pings it before he auto attacks it, by the way, if you guys didn't catch that. 
he pings the creep before he's going to auto to tell his core to time his auto attack at his auto attack so they don't get it denied. Now, it didn't work, and they didn't get it, but this is also a good habit for supports to be in because range creeps are very, very valuable, and everyone that gets denied is a huge amount of golden experience not going your way. You can see how aggressive the enemy team is playing this. They're, they're basically just going hard on this guy. He makes sure the range creep goes to his team. He's got a salve for his Ursa if he needs it. He's going to walk back. He's going to salve him. Now, the Ursa didn't get out of vision there, which is... This is more of a mistake on the Ursa than I would say it is on the AA. He waited for the Ursa to hopefully get out of vision by walking behind the tree, and then he salved him. But the Ursa walked down, got back into vision, and Matthew was level 2, so he casted rockets, and he lost the salve. This kind of stuff, when it happens, is very, very bad. Because now, all of a sudden, he has to send out another salve from base. He's level 1, so his courier is ultra slow. And this Ursa only has tangos. So, the main thing about having salves instead of being able to pull tangos to your core is that this Ursa no longer can contest the wave. He cannot contest the wave unless he's probably let's say 70% health or higher because both these DK and this Tinker Hero are going to hit level 2. Like, Tinker's already 2. And when he walks up, if he gets Dragon Tailed, Breathe Fire Laser, he might just die. Right? So when you're trying to occupy a lane, you need to be very aware of how much health your core needs to feel safe to walk up. So when the salve gets taken away, what's really happening is his ability to contest the wave is getting taken away. This Tinker does not feel scared to just walk up right now and auto-attack either of these heroes. They hit level 2 first on the Tinker. The salve just got broken. This guy has no way to regenerate his HP. This lane is already kind of rough, right? So let's see, let's see what happens. Tinker is going to be chasing the Ursa away. The Ursa walks up to the creep wave, gets stunned. Gets lasered. And the rockets are just going to kill him. So, what transpired because the salve got broken was the Ursa just dies. Now, a lot of people are going to be asking themselves, well, why did he walk up to the wave? Isn't it just better to, like, not die? So, there's two ways to look at it. The first is that, yes, dying is obviously not great, especially as a safe laner. But how much time does he lose sitting in the lane at 30% HP versus how much does he gain by being able to come back to the lane with more regen and full health in terms of overall CS? This is kind of a hard thing for people to kind of grasp, especially at the low level. But there are often times when dying in your lane can be beneficial because it means that your enemy is lower on resources and you can return to the lane and farm a lot more with less obstruction. Now, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen here, but at first glance, I would say that that death is probably not the worst. Especially since his AA is still able to contest and soak, on, uh, soak up some of the EXP. Alright, so now... Ursa's going to be back in the lane. Ursa is still pretty low level. Not level... Not level 2 yet, so... Again... It's kind of hard to play aggro on this lane. And you can see now why it makes a lot more sense that Dubu blocked the camp. Because he kind of maybe didn't envision the Ursa dying like that. But he definitely understood the matchup dynamic. is just not very good for them until later. And you notice how relentless he is with his autoing. Like he's just hitting and hitting and hitting and hitting all the time. He actually just straight, straight up gets a kill. Because he's just... Always looking for damage, always autoing. He's sending out more regen. He's even buying more regen now and another sentry to ensure that he can unblock his small camp because right now at three minutes it's still blocked. But he didn't prioritize it to a degree where he just left his Ursa hanging in the lane. This is actually another point that I'll cover really quickly. As the five, your default mode does not have to be pulling. Oftentimes, pulling will just hurt your carry's ability to hit creeps. The The old 5 and 1 dynamic was usually just, I'm going to pull every single time I can, no matter what, in every single matchup forever. That's what everybody did for a very long time. That is not how 
it's done anymore. If your safe laner cannot occupy the lane, it is usually just better to be with him unless the lane is very, very far up. So this is the first point in the game where the lane has been away from the tower for any meaningful stretch of time. So now is the point where you look at it and you say, hmm, would a pull benefit me here? And it might because pulling the lane back towards my own tower is probably a good thing for multiple reasons. But if you're just sitting down by your tier one and you're trying to unblock a camp and you're trying to pull a small camp and you're not stacking it and you're not doing like a two or three pull, then you're kind of just hurting your carry. So with that being said, we will continue. And even now, the Ursa doesn't feel great about walking up to the wave. But there's just a lot of auto attacks coming out from Dubu. He's just constantly hitting, constantly trying to deal damage. This is a really good habit to be in, especially for people who like to play AA. Or if you play any of the really long range auto attack heroes. He's always playing next to his core. He's just autoing. He's dealing damage. He's trading with the hero that can actually be killed, which is another really important thing to keep in mind. Stupendous. Whenever he can't hit the Tinker, he's hitting the DK. But whenever he can hit the Tinker, he's hitting the Tinker. So the reason this kill gets set up, I just want to go back. Like, let's go back. How long was it? This is like 40 seconds. 40 seconds ago, Matthew has just TP'd back to the lane. He just died, right? Dubu killed him to the left not too long prior to this. And Dubu's got his stick charges. He's got tangos. He's got salve. Let's check on Matthew's items. Matthew has no regen, okay? Keeping track of what the enemy team has in their inventory for a five, and for anyone really, is always important. But it's even more important when you can spot a weakness in someone's inventory. So right now, this guy cannot gain health. He can only gain health from his base regen. So we make the distinction in the moment. I'm sure Dubu clicked on him and said, oh yeah, this guy has no regen. I'm just going to hit him. I mean, he might have hit him anyway because it's a tinker and hitting DK doesn't seem that good. But in this moment, because he TPs back to lane with no tangos, no salve, you know, nothing really. AA is great at just harassing from a range. So eventually this guy's going to be in kill range, right? You hit him enough times, he's going to get low. So he hits him once. He throws a chilling touch at him. He hits him again. And then he hits the DK when the Tinker walks out of range. There's always some action being taken by Dubu to ensure that there's pressure being applied in the lane. He's not walking around in trees, just back and forth, unsure what to do. He's identified that there's a weakness in the lane, and the weakness is that the Tinker doesn't have any way to regenerate. Because even right now, all these spells being cast, eight stick charges, this DK doesn't do enough damage. Matthew just uses nukes. So even though they're going on Ursa, they don't have enough in the tank to really make any kill pressure happen here. And Dubu is just still on it, right? He's, he's still just hitting and hitting and hitting. Stupendous. Now his Ursa is going hard here for the Tinker, and he realizes, yeah, okay, this guy can just die. And he even gets the Courier. Now the Ursa might die for this. We'll see if he's able to salve him. I'm not sure if he will or not. I think he was scared of a breathe fire, perhaps. Okay, so he salves him when he's sure he's away, and then also body blocks. The DK was going for a salve break, but he doesn't get it. But all this stuff has been set up by just understanding what needs to happen in the lane. Now, this is something that's going to take time for a lot of people to understand. But hopefully, by watching stuff like this and, and talking about it, that people can kind of get a better idea of sometimes, you know, it's okay to play the lane. Just play the lane straight up. You know, trade your spells, trade your regen. Sometimes it's better to pull. Sometimes it's better to, you know, stack or whatever. But being able to tell in advance what is needed of you as a support is really, really nice. And obviously, Dubu is a super experienced player. He kind of understands, you know, all the ins and outs of the lane. But right now, even with all this, like, I'd say he played the lane extremely well. His Ursa still only has 15 CS, right? Now, does that really mean that the 5 did a bad job? I don't think so. I think he did really well here. But this just goes to show the reinforcement of the idea 
Blocking the large camp was really good. Right? Not trying to pull was really good. Because if the Urs is struggling after having killed a hero two times, think of how much he would be struggling if Dubu just wasn't playing the lane at all and just trying to pull and playing off to the side against a Tinker. This lane would have been much, much harder. Definitely would have been much, much harder. So at this point, the Undying has made the transition down to the bot lane. And we can probably say at this point that the laning phase is going to get pretty close to breaking down. There's not really a set timer on when the laning phase really ends for every Dota game. But there is usually a point where one of the safe laners or one of the mid players will decide that they're going to make some sort of movement on the map. And it can be five minutes, it can it can be six minutes at the rune. That's a very common timing. Someone gets a haste, someone gets a double damage at six minutes, and a rotation happens. Even being that early, the laning phase can kind of be kind of be over. So when that happens, it's time to make some some movements around the map. So he secures the bottom rune. He's there at the six minute mark. I believe he also did he stack? Yeah, he also stacks this camp. So he's he's using a lot of his time very efficiently, even outside of the, the lane itself. So he's making sure that the Invoker is unable to pick up this rune. The Storm obviously can't get it because he's getting harassed and he's very low on mana. The other thing, too, is he knows he doesn't have vision of the high ground anywhere. He can't see. So if you're just leaving a rune and a river as the five, and you're just kind of hoping your, your mid player or whoever can come get it, at least make sure you can zone the other hero away from the rune if it's a mid, because sometimes you won't be able to. Sometimes you'll just have to say, okay, I need to take it just so this guy doesn't get it. And that's okay, too. A lot of these plays that happen in the game, at the time, it doesn't... It's very hard to place a, a tangible impact on these choices. But I'll tell you that from the first, like, six minutes of this game, he's already done so much. Like, there's already so many things that he's done correctly for the lane. Imagine if the salve on the Ursa hadn't been broken, and he was able to sit at high HP and never had that death under the tier 1, right? He would have been alive long enough for the second salve that he was sending out to make it, and then the lane could have actually been even better than it was. So, for the first six or so minutes of the game, I'd say this is some pretty stellar 5 play. AA is obviously one of the really popular heroes right now, so I'm sure there's a ton of people out there who would be interested to know how to play more, but the whole purpose of this video was really just for the first couple of minutes to try to give people an idea of what is good to do and what is not good to do trying to keep the videos a bit shorter no more 45 minute rant videos even though i love doing that but that's going to be the end of this video i may use this past the six minute mark for more of an early mid game decision making video in the future i'm sure some people would like to see that kind of stuff too we'll just keep this replay on tap for just such an occasion so thank you guys very much for hanging out hope you guys are all doing well you guys can check me live at twitch.tv slash same as the youtube and i hope to see you guys very soon